Clive Lafferty, welcome to the lockdown sessions. It's nice to see you. Hello, Brad. It's very nice to be here. I'm very excited and looking forward to our chat. I was just saying that um, it was 12 years ago um, that we met um, and I was highlighting that uh, you had told me how brilliant War Horse was going to be as a play. Yes. Um, and if I could have walked out of it in the second half, I, I, I would have. But there were too many people along the row for <laughs> me to, <laughs> to get up and make a scene. So if you feel like you want to get up and walk out halfway through this, I completely um, understand. But you uh-huh. are the founder of Tandem Consulting, uh, Consultancy. Yeah. Um, we just call it tandem like the the business name is tandem consult limited i think but okay so tandem tandem. i I love your logo as well as a bite because there's something instantly collaborative doing stuff together just in the visual that you've got there doing it in tandem with someone else i I loved what that presents um maybe you could share a little bit how you came on that name later yeah your focus when you're working with your clients is in and around the coaching, the leadership development space, particularly around DI. Yes. Um, and looking from a generalist perspective as well as some of the specifics. And I thought it would be really cool to get you in for a 30, 40 minute chat to kind of get to hear your perspectives as we move through into a, like a secondary lockdown. Yes. Some of the things that you've been observing in clients, in the people you're working with, and where coaching and leadership development needs to go in order for us in our industry to kind of help leaders move through this difficult moment. So my starter for 10 is the same for everyone who joins a lockdown session, by the way. (laughs) What have you been observing in people's behaviours and actions when it comes to leaders and businesses over the last sort of what, five, six months now? Yeah, well, it's been a very strange time. And I think probably the first thing that I observed um, is that everyone went quiet for a couple of months. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think I needed to be very respectful for that as well. I think um, there's a lot of people that work in the field that we work in that will... Um, of course, you know, we all love our clients and we love working with them. But when we get together, we spend a lot of time maybe um, complaining is not the right word, but maybe, you know, critiquing, moaning, <laughs> moaning, you know, they're asking for this, but, you know, really, they should be doing it like this. And, oh, if only they could do it like that. And I think the view that we've always had is that the clients should lead the way, right? They, they run these businesses that are often hugely, hugely successful businesses. So they're doing things right, or they're certainly doing a majority of stuff right. Right. And it's actually not very helpful to come in from a place of um, a critique or, you know, should be doing it like this. So I guess one of our catchphrases, if you like, is um, you, you work with what is presented to you. And I think that's what we've continued to do over these last four or five months. And what was presented to us in those first six or seven weeks was um, nothing. <laughs> yeah, because they were busy. Silence. Yeah. And they were busy leading their organisations in the best way that they could right. in a time that you just never would have imagined that we'd ever see, you know. Um, and of course you want to go in and you want to help, but actually I don't think it's very helpful for a learning and development provider to sort of go in when the time is really tough and, um, you know, trying to start selling your services, I guess. So I think for those first six, seven weeks of lockdown, it was about, right, let's stand back. They're going to do the work that they need to do and they're probably going to do it really well. Um, They're going to learn a lot from that. And I think that will be the time when it's time for Tandem to then step back. Yeah. It's like, let's, let's wait for it to come back to us rather than, you know, try and push in, into them. And that's exactly what, you know, that's exactly what did happen. And I think most of the leaders that I've spoken to and most of our clients have dealt with this situation, you know, 
in the best way possible and have probably learnt loads as a result of what's happened and I think it's our job now as a coach or as someone that's just partnering them or advising them to help them take stock of that and to realise what they've learned and realise how they can then use that to take things forward. I think you make a really interesting point about not going in and saying, well, this is what you should be doing. Because actually what you're doing there, from my perspective, is you're adopting that, that coach's stance. Yeah. You're not the expert. That They're the expert and you're there to guide and reflect and offer perspective. Yes. Which actually, by definition, requires them to come to us. Yeah. I suppose... A caveat would be, you know, Tan has been around for five plus years. Yeah. Um, so as a result, if you were maybe four months into your business, you'd be forgiven for maybe <laughs> scratching around looking for extra work in yeah. that moment. Yeah. Um, because you've got client relationships. And, you know, if they say, well, Clive, you know, we're going to drop that session next week. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't worry about it. Yeah. But how did you just sit with that? Did it come easy? Is there a conflict, the business person in you that says, you've got to drive, got to drive, times are difficult? Yeah, it was, it was a very strange time. You know, it has been for all of us, but I'm pretty good with change. And, um, you know, I enjoy change. It's, for me, it's exciting. I mean, even by my standards, this was probably a bit too much. You know, right. I had this kind of sat at my computer one day going, oh, I've got four months worth of work booked ahead. And then, you know, within 24 hours, cancellation, 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 cancellation. That, yeah. that got things a bit panicky, I guess. Um, so I probably did what a lot of people in our situation did. was like, OK, so we need to diversify what, well, you know, I need to earn money over these next two two months. What can I do? What can I do? And started brainstorming some ideas and started panicking about things. Um, but it was, you know, I gave it 24 hours and it was, as, you know, we talked about before, my customers or Tandem's customers are going to be dealing with, you know, furloughing people. Like a lot of, a lot of our work comes in through HR departments so I, that was my background before I went into learning and development. I was um, in generalist HR. I know how stressful that job is. And I think when you're dealing with what was thrown at them four or five months ago, whenever it was now, back in March, their stress levels are going to go like through the roof. Um, so... It was just the case of going, I need to, I need to respect that. Um, but I also have such a high level of trust with the people that we work with that knowing and trusting that they will come back when they need to come back. Um, and sitting with that feeling, you know, it, it wasn't easy. Um, but I would say sort of within three or four days, it was settling and I was feeling a bit more comfortable with that um and the way that I can kind of get comfortable with that I told myself I was like let's just pretend we're all on sabbatical for two months all right let's let's think of us we're stepping off like that. we're going um we can still work you know we're probably not going to be doing much paid work but we're going to read all those books that we said we were going to read, or we're going to watch all those TED talks that we've never had time to watch. <laughs> I didn't get to that. No. <laughs> on my list. <laughs> or oh. we're going to reread the important books, or we're going to practice loads of mindfulness, or you know, do all the things that you never have time to do. You know, that sort of important, not urgent quadrant type stuff. Mm. And that that's kind of. What, what I did and I think what most of the team did as well um, and yeah it, within sort of eight weeks it felt like stuff started to come back in a, in a de very different way to what it had done before so again it was completely different and you know it feels like a new way of working all the time but 
that can feel exciting as well. well. Well, that's the word that, I mean, you've literally taken the word right out of my mouth. That, that for me is the exciting bit. So I wonder then with the areas that you as a business focus on, yeah. and, and if I could, I'd love to start with the team coaching one, because that's definitely a, 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 a quiet passion of mine. Um, yeah. Bringing groups together and clearing out stuff and looking at how to sort of function and operate. Yes. What kind of role can team coaching play now? And in the back of my mind, I kind of got this landscape of psychological safety, emotional safety, the yeah. challenges of people being followed, coming back, not coming back, reorgs, all this stuff that's going on. Yes. Where do you see team coaching playing a part and, and the value that it can really bring to yeah. businesses? Yeah. I see it really taking off. Uh, well, I, I hope that it's really going to take off because I think it can play a really important and critical role given what's going on at the moment. I think lots of people that have businesses like ours, you know, we will have a lot of off-the-shelf type products, which are fine because they serve a purpose at certain times of year. Maybe it's appraisal time. But... Um, it, do, it doesn't go d deep enough a lot of the time. And I think what team coaching can do is rather than go, right, here's a model or here's a product and this is really going to help you, which you might do for individual type stuff, but getting a team together and, and working with them as a group and creating that psychological safety, which weirdly I think seems to work a bit better virtually in a weird way but we could talk about that later mm -hmm. um you can you can go deep basically and you can go much deeper and that's when you get to the the truth of stuff and that's when you start to see people feeling motivated and wanting to take the right sort of course of action rather than coming in with a here we go this this model is going to be brilliant for you or this this toolkit's going to be brilliant it's like as with coaching, you know, get them to do the work. And I love facilitating that process. Is there a difference for you when you see an individual one-on-one -on -one come up with those responses to how a team comes up with that? Because there's something I think very enabling about a team being honest and transparent and challenging of each other yeah. yet still signing up to something at the end that they all agree to. Yeah, I think it's even more exciting when you see a group have like collective light bulb moments, if you like. Yeah. Um, it's harder work. And I think, uh, you know, if you're coaching someone one-to-one, -one, yeah, it's, it's quite intimate and people can access things that are probably more challenging because they feel safer because it's one-on-one. -on -one. In a group, people, there's always gonna be a bit of a, a guard up with some people, but for me, the challenge and the fun of the job is, is watching those guards come down. Yeah. Um, but I always think when you're dealing with a team, you've got to go through a lot more pain before you get out of the other side, which is um, crazy. Uh, no, I hear you. I was running a session just this morning with a, a European-wide HR team uh, looking at building their team purpose. And uh, we'd almost got to a point where everyone was signing up, like six out of seven people had signed up to this statement that they'd collectively come together with. Yeah. <laughs> and then the last person uh, highlights the words that they don't agree with. Yeah. And for a moment, I was like, oh... So here comes the sting okay. and literally I could see everybody on Zoom, they all sat back suddenly, suddenly there were notes in chat people agreeing, uh, well hang on let's just revisit that um, Brad, could we do another quick breakout room and just unpick and unpack that, yeah of course we've got time guys, 15 minutes here we go, I'm opening the room and you know when they came back, they came up with their purpose and, and what that purpose was for Okay. And you're absolutely right. People will land on their own decisions. And as a team, because it's collectively brought together, somehow it's even stronger with regards to how they breathe life into it. Yeah. 
So the question then for you as, as, a, as a team coach is how can organizations maybe that haven't embraced even coaching yet? Because coaching yeah. is a little bit of an intervention. Yeah. You'll still feel it's a little bit remedial. Yes. Like in the sports world where each professional sports person has five different coaches. Yeah. In the corporate world, it's still a little bit, hmm. Yeah. How can companies embrace team coaching? Yeah. I think it's how people like you and I present it. Um, and I think it's the words that we might use when we're talking about it as well. So you will have some clients that you know just don't buy into the language of that stuff. So just don't call it team coaching. Right. So you, it's just, you, I mean, you're coaching them through that process. It will be questions like, right, come on, what's what your team really struggling with at the moment? Or, you know, what what's going to make them really successful? What's going to be the biggest challenge over the next 12 months? And it's like, well, let's just all get together and talk about it. You know, you, you frame it in that way. And then the leaders will start to go, yeah, I think we'd really benefit from that. And of okay. course, you're doing what you and I would call team coaching. But for them, they are... They're problem solving, they're getting to the bottom of their communication issues, they're working through challenges, and you know, they're but they it's, are essentially being coached. It, it's great that actually, as human beings, we're so wired that actually things don't change that much. I can remember in 2002 trying to get executive one to one coaching into the world of professional football, right? And I could not got, get anyone to buy in to okay. the principle. But yeah. as soon as I called it mental fitness, <laughs> yeah. yeah, they all loved it. Yeah, totally. So, it, yeah, so actually it's about how you frame it. Yeah. Um, are all teams able to be coached? You know, sometimes with individuals, not everyone can be coached. There is the need to have a desire to be challenged, to have things yeah. reflected back. Can, is it the same with teams or can every team benefit from it? Um, I probably because the, being the optimist and the enthusiast that I am I would say yes every team can but when we think of those teams that can't be that's that's what I love dealing with like I love I love working with people that think what we do is bullshit right, right yeah <laughs> it's all, fluffy it's all yeah. fluffy nonsense yeah and you can see their reactions and you can see the body language change when you're working with them. And I love just trying to gradually sort of crack those people in a way or, or win them over. You know, I want them to know that I'm here to help and to do good work. And I think um, working in some of the industries, like we work with a lot of fashion clients and we have done because my career was... Arcadia for a very long time and you know and I think back to like menswear designers for example that were just like these really cool uh 20 something year old lads you know that were just way cooler than any of us yeah. and I was used to think they're the toughest ones to get because they probably just think this is a load of rubbish right and I think I did quite a good job in winning them over actually and it's um I'm always just trying to be like, just being really honest and really open, cut any HR language, L&D language out that's going to feel um, almost intimidating to them or that they might not understand. And just getting down to that level of talking human being to human being. And I think you can get anyone and you can get any team as well. Uh, I like the thought of that. Um, and we do a lot of work with tech companies and medical services companies. And it's the same with them, that they look at HR language as just simply ridiculous. Yeah. Um, we are the, the fluffy side of the organisation. Yeah. Um, you know, they deal in code and uh, dots uh, and colons. Yes. And actually, um, if you've ever worked with doctors, um, they're more likely to highlight a example you give that isn't factually correct than they are to take the meaning behind the anecdote. Yes. Um, 
but you're right if we reframe and I suppose that that leads me into my next question to you which is something you referenced before which is the kind of the you had to become a little bit more creative with how you were looking at work yeah at Tandem like with us at CTG you're involved in that leadership space and leadership development yes um, and you kind of had a, a little line there about you know creative approach to leadership development tell us a bit more about that because I think the world is ready for a more creative approach we don't want the same old stuff because the world's so different now yeah so what does that look like from your eyes yeah creative approach well I think um I've always enjoyed working creatively. Um, my undergraduate degree was actually in music, which uh, is quite a strange move into the world that I've ended up being in. But, you know, so I still, I love music. I love art. I love um, uh, going to exhibitions, going to live concerts. I love all of that stuff. And I also, when you look at our client base, they're all pretty creative organizations as well whether it be there's some ad agencies there's some fashion there's hospitality um so I always think with the way that we design the work that we do we try and make it as creatively engaging as possible um and it's usually quite pacey as well because of the nature of the the way our clients mm -hmm. work too so I'll always try and take a topic and go right so th here's the standard approach let's just tip it on its head or do something differently with it so I guess one of our best-selling products if you like we do like an introduction to leadership um, but I teach people how to conduct an orchestra in order to do it so it's great as a warm-up because you get everyone standing up and they're having a laugh learning but then we look at some of the great conductors of the world and how their styles are all different um, Essentially, it's a model of situational leadership. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what we do is we use music and different styles of conducting in order to demonstrate the point. Um, so we don't sort of go, oh, and here's a situational leadership model and here's how it links. We just do the music and let the lessons just kind of sink in and it, and it works beautifully every time. Uh, I, I love that one. It's triggered two thoughts for me. One... Um, uh, in January this year, my last like family trip went to Paris. Uh, a friend of mine who also works as a coach uh, collaborates with a conductor. Uh, they actually take an orchestra out to corporates and they take the orchestra in and they run leadership development days uh, showing people how to learn to play instruments who have never picked up a violin or okay. played the piano before. They actually got someone from the 500 of us in the theatre, pulled someone out from the audience who'd never played the piano yeah. and got them within 20 minutes to play, along with the orchestra, uh, this sort of song. Yeah. Um, and his name's Onidin, actually. Maybe look him up. I think you, you'd quite like him. He's French, yeah. a French conductor. Okay. But... I'm actually, and I, I think we can talk afterwards because uh, I think I might like to get you involved with this, but my nephew is an artist and he, myself and uh, another colleague, Alessandro from Italy, are actually at the moment currently pulling together a creative approach to do some kind of big workshops around art and music and using musicians and artists to help us kind of create lessons for development and I think it might be well we can talk another time not in here yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think it's it's absolutely in that way I love that that sort of creative approach yeah. and are they able to keep time can they conduct in two time three time and four time so we do we just do it in four four time okay uh, and we use some David Bowie to help us along with that Excellent. or we then go into the the classical stuff um but it's, it's more about kind of watching other people's styles as well and, and getting them to see how you can lead from a very different place to someone else, but you can still produce excellence. So I kind of hate this idea. I, I often still get told by a lot of clients is, oh, he or she needs to develop their leadership skills. 
And I'm like, well, what do they need to develop? They go, well, they're really introverted. And I'm like, oh, what does that mean you can't lead if you're introverted? And there's, I feel like there's still this myth around that to lead, you need to be charismatic and you need to be extroverted. And what I try to do with this is to go, do you know what? Um, leading from a quiet place can be really strong and really powerful as well. And, you know, so we've got a conductor that, that very much does that. So, um, well, and, and if you take the conductor, you know, I come from a musical family of, of professional musicians. Um, when you look at a conductor, one, they don't speak for the whole time. Uh, they interpret the vision of the composer yes. um, and then they get anywhere from six to 150 people to breathe life into a score. Yes. And if they move at the wrong moment, the wrong people will come in. So yeah. it's completely about bringing in the strength and leaning and leaning in and leaning out yeah. with your orchestra yeah. um, the whole time. And yeah. I think that's a great I love that. I'd love to see a video of uh, people learning to conduct and learn leadership. I think that sounds cool. <laughs> so we, we can say that the conductor's like the CEO managing all these different departments. Yeah. Like the strings and the brass and the woodwind. And, you know, you make them, You even as a, you might not be a technical expert, you know, so you might be, a, as a conductor, you might be a violinist, but, you know, you're still having to lead the trumpets and the tubers, you know, so... <laughs> And it's in the same way that a CEO might not have ever worked, I don't know, in a finance department. You know, we still got to lead the finance department. So there's kind of all these parallels which just sort of sink in. Yeah, right. because they don't need to know how to do a PL. They just need to understand the PL needs to get done. So how do I make sure that those experts bring out yeah. the right thing at the right time in the right moment? Yeah. And it's bringing out the expertise of others, which is the really you know, exciting part and an important part of leadership. It's not about the doing it all for yourself. It's like surrounding yourself with people who are experts in their own fields. And to me, that, that kind of links again, because what I've observed in leadership, and particularly in this last year, is the spread of the philosophies around inclusive leadership. Yes. Um, and inclusivity, it's, it's, it's a very easy word to band around. I see it a lot. I see it on LinkedIn a lot. I've posted on it myself. Yes. Um, what does it really mean, inclusive leadership? But yes. this concept and construct, particularly now in how do you include people? How do you get those diverse views? Yeah. I guess it leans into the DNI conversation a little bit. Yes. Um, again, another area where where you focus. Yes. Inclusivity. Yes. So I want your help here because yeah. I'm Neanderthal in my approach. Sometimes I'm told, um, yeah. and I take the feedback willingly. Um, how can we lean into that DNI conversation more? Yes. And really help people breathe life into inclusivity. Because it's not just about leaders need to understand DNI. This yes. is all of us. I mean, yeah. working or not, yes. how do we embrace yeah. what's the principles behind diversity yeah. and inclusion? Yeah. So something that we talk about, and I think, you know, we could go on for hours about this, but to try and keep it quite brief, what I think is really important is this um, starting with yourselves. Like, um, so this idea of like a dominant culture. And I think as a leadership team, you need to be aware of what the dominant culture is in your organization. So what we mean by that is, um, if you look at the positions of power in an organization, and you look at the protected char characteristics of the people that hold those positions of power, i.e. are they white, are they black, are they um, minority ethnic, are they male, are they female, are they gay, are they straight, are they Christian, are they atheist, are they Muslim? And when you kind of almost, do, you could very quickly do a quick summary of when we look at the positions of power, what's the dominant group? Um, that allows you to, to kind of take stock and then go, 
okay, so then what does that mean for people that don't fit into that dominant culture? So people that don't tick all those boxes, this is where we get the idea of privilege. So, you know, if we look at an organization and it's at the positions of power are mostly white, mostly male, heterosexual, Christian, for example, which is the case for quite a lot of organizations. You know, if you tick all of those four boxes, then you, you come to that organization with a place of privilege, like the most privilege. However, if you don't tick all of those boxes, then your, your privilege diminishes. Right. And what creating an inclusive culture for me is about is going, for well, those people that don't tick all the boxes, how do we make them feel as included as those that do tick all of the boxes? Which is highlighted explicitly in the world of sport. Okay. Because um, if you take that, your definitions there, yeah. if I look at the positions of power, say in football, professional football. Yes. White, middle to upper class. Yes. 55 year olds and upwards men. Okay. Um, with money. Yeah. All straight. Yes. And for some reason, in 92 professional football clubs, yeah. there isn't one outwardly gay player. Yes. Now, that's just not possible. It's is impossible. It? It's impossible. <laughs> so, clearly, if we take your, your ranking system, yeah. those people don't feel safe to yes. live their life openly yeah. because they would be excluded if they don't belong to yeah. this majority sort of use of, of the, the power positions. Yeah. And um, sad. you'll probably know more about this than me, but I was reading something this morning, I think. Was there a football match that happened quite recently where there was some homophobic abuse coming in from the crowd? Yeah. And one of the players who I, I'm assuming he was straight, I don't know, walked off and refused to play. Correct. And actually that, that team have been banned and fined okay. for their crowd's abuse. Okay. So that player that decided to walk off, he wasn't going to be part of that. You know, let's say he's a straight man. That's an ally, you know. Yeah. He, he's an ally. And he's also, he's not a bystander. So... We always say, we'll often, with these topics that are sometimes a bit tricky to talk about, we'll often go, oh, someone else will, someone else will deal with that or someone else will raise that. And we kind of, we stand back a little bit and we, we allow this stuff to happen, like we all do, because we don't want to make things feel uncomfortable. So, you know, what that guy walking off the football pitch did a, a very brave thing. And it's that bravery where we'll start to see change come about hopefully so i love that you know there was a poem back in the second world war by a priest called uh, pastor nimola where he talked about you know they came for the jews i didn't speak up because i wasn't a jew and they came for the romanese and i didn't speak up because i wasn't a romani and as the mm -hmm. poem progresses yes the last line is and then they came for me and there was no one to speak it's, up for me yeah yeah i'd forgotten about that one and it's that's 75 years ago yeah and we're still in the same place mm. where we're looking for people to speak up. So is, is the work that you do around d &I, is it about helping people speak up? Or is it about changing the landscape? Or a bit, bit of both, maybe, actually, when I say that. I would say it's a, it's, it's a very broad picture. Um, I would say what's important for me is there's so many terms being banded about at the moment you know I've, I've used 10 probably in the last five minutes around um uh being an ally um a dominant culture or an inclusive leadership and what that looks like and not everyone's really clear on what these things actually mean and so i would say at tandem we're educators we, we want to come out and, and share what those things mean and we want to enable conversations to happen that we think should be happening. Yeah. And we want to make people feel really comfortable and really safe to have those questions and feel comfortable that 
you know, they can say the wrong thing as long as they they learn from the fact that they've said the wrong thing. You know, people feel like it's so sensitive that they're kind of walking on eggshells around it. And what we try and do with our workshop is create an environment where you're not you're not afraid to ask the questions that, that need to be asked. And we answer them and we facilitate discussion that just feels really interesting and, and useful. Um, so I would say we come from like an ed educational point of view, I guess. And um, Well, that's where it starts, right? I mean, it starts with awareness, then with education, and then with sort of practice and, and, and execution. But I suppose some people's fear, I know I hear it from my parents and their generation all the time, they, <laughs> they make comments with what I call loose lips sometimes. Yes. yes. Um, and when I call them out on it, or, you know, my brother will say, mom, dad, you know, auntie, you can't say that. Yes. Their response is, look, don't judge us. Don't judge what we did back then with today's lens. Yeah. And although there's truth in that, and I completely understand it. Yes. The lens is different today. Yes. And almost if we can't be inclusive, then... You know, whether it's team coaching and the psychological safety of growing a team, whether it's the pure constructs of what DNI can help organizations yeah. become to in, engage and embrace diverse contribution. Yeah. Um, I don't believe there's an organization out there that's getting it 100% right. Otherwise, yeah. the need wouldn't be there, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I do think that's an interesting point you've raised with the generations as well and I think they're probably so used to being told off like that's offensive you can't say that so actually it really closes the door on the conversation it's like well, well this is the way we see the world end of story and really, I think what our role is to not stop the conversation but to open up the conversation right yeah which yeah. is coaching skills again. And actually, when you um, come from a place of, I'm right, they're wrong, you're never going to get anywhere. But actually, let's talk about th their experiences when, when they were young, and let's think about why that might have changed now. And having that, I, I sort of patronisingly call it a grown-up conversation, <laughs> yeah. rather than that fight of like, um, well, I know I come from a right place and you you come from a wrong place. It doesn't get us anywhere. I mean, that's what kind of happened with Brexit, didn't it? In that yeah. people people were in, people out, and it just became this thing of, well, I know that I'm right and I know that you're wrong, and that doesn't enable good discussion and good debate. No, we've even, we've left officially, haven't we? We're in the, the transition period and people are still arguing about it. Yeah. Um, and you just have to look across the, uh, the pond to yeah. see how challenging it is when a government of a global power, a yes. superpower, yes. has, when you look at the positions of power, Yes. and the extremes that exist within it, yes. what actually happens to an organisation, it becomes divisive. Yeah. Uh, and actually, it's quite sad to watch this fabric of, you know, the US dissipate in front of our, of our eyes. Yes, completely. Um, I, I think it's, uh, you're right about the I'm right, you're wrong, that doesn't go anywhere. But of course, as a psychologist, uh, a cognitive distortion that some people have I possess it at times, yeah. uh, is that I'm always right. So what happens then? Because yeah. if, if I'm always right, then I can't be wrong. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's the trouble that I have. I think that's really important that we acknowledge that we've all got it. Like, <laughs> of course I'm right. You know, I know I am. And then I'll, I'll try and apply this kind of approach where I'm like, right, come on, let's just be open. Let's listen to what they've got to say. And then it can sort of come across as a bit, patronizing in a way as well it's like oh yeah I really want to hear what you've got to say <laughs> oh, I know I'm completely right <laughs> right and actually I do genuinely want to hear it and then when I've listened to you we'll agree that I was right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm just winning you over to my point of view with correct my, with um, my questions <laughs> I, I think uh, listen uh, I, I feel like we're going full circle so we're probably drawing uh, to a close I'd love
maybe as a final point, when when you look forward and you see sort of the next sort of six months, you know, we've been through the first six. Someone said to me, I was talking to a teenager the other day and I said, uh, what are you and your friends talking about 2020? You know, what's it been like for you? Mm-hmm. And he just said to me, oh, Brad, he goes, we're just saying that was year one of lockdown. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. oh, wow, I hope not. Yeah. But if we assume it was the year of lockdown rather than just year one. Yes. When you look forward, um, what do you see as the real opportunity for leaders, let's say, um, in their businesses? With the lens that you have of, of yeah. L&D, yeah. um, where are there opportunities for them to really grow and stretch themselves and, and help their people? Yeah. So speaking from, um, I guess, from our client base and the types of clients that we work with, um, a big thing was always around flexibility and, and flexible working. Um, and especially uh, certain industries, so let's say the retail industry, for example, um, you know, very forward thinking and innovative from a product point of view, but actually from a, a ways of working structure, it was Monday to Friday. It's, you know, trade meetings happen on a Monday. Um, these meetings happen on a Tuesday, very a fixed sort of structure. Um, and of course, that's had to go out of the window. I mean, it's, it might still happen virtually, but I think what a lot of leaders of those organisations have gone is that, OK, we, we didn't actually encourage flexible working before or working right. at home or working, you know, different hours. We, we've kind of been forced to now. We have to do it. And brilliantly, they've, a lot of them are discovering that it actually works. And, you know, they can still be a success without having everyone in the office on a Monday morning in this, you know, really stressful meeting. Um, so I think that's going to be the, the biggest change. Is I hope, with my positive hat on, is this flexibility is actually going to lead to you know, more innovation and, and, and better ways of working and a, and a more motivated workforce. Um, and it's getting them to embrace the flexibility that's going to allow those things to come through and, and those things to shine as well. And uh, I love that. That's a message of hope it, based it on creativity. Yeah. But I should also say the other thing that I'm slightly concerned about is, you know, you get people at a manager level up to a leadership level, you know, working flexibly for them might be quite nice because they've got a nice house that's, you know, outside of London or they have a garden or they have an office in the garden. Um, Think back to when, you know, I was 21, 22, first moved to London um, in a flat share with four other people, having one room to yourself, right. um, not even being able to afford a computer at the time. I think that's probably changed now. Mm-hmm. But I, I think it, it could be challenging for those at the more sort of junior ends coming through. So I think that's going to be another challenge is we have to equip everyone to, to work successfully in, in the flexible and it's not just, you know, from a generational perspective. Um, I know people across the age spectrums. If you're living in an apartment and, you know, you're on the third floor yeah. and there's no balcony and there's no garden and you're in a central town, yeah. and you might have kids and you're homeschooling and there's all those risks. Yeah. There's there's challenge, but I want to rest on the hope bit because I think uh, yes. hope with creativity. <laughs> yeah. And that's why uh, I'm I'm going to uh get you in touch uh, to join a call with uh, my nephew and uh, Alessandro as we think about how to inspire hope through uh, creativity. Right. That's uh, my nephew's sort of purpose in life. Oh, good. And I think he'll uh, he'll shine to you instantly okay. um, with art and music in the backdrop. Um, Clive, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I'm so pleased um, I made contact 
Um, yes. And after 12 years, it seems that we can still have a really good old chin wag. Yeah. <laughs> <That's laughs> stuff. Um, Clive Lafferty, founder of Tandem, um, team coach, creative leadership development. Thank you yes. so much. And I think in the new year, we'll have to get you back. So you'll do a second episode and we'll see what the landscape looks like then. Brilliant. I'd love to do that. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, nice to see you again. Yeah, Clive, we'll see you soon. Take care. All right. Cheers. Bye. Bye.